the Rangers Journal Knights. Good evening and welcome to the Rangers Journal Old Firm Review. Um, not the best at us, but a couple of good guys with me to go through it all. First off, I'll come to you, Billy. How are you doing? Hi, Dave. It's the worst of times and it is the worst of times. So that's how I am at the moment. Yeah, mate. Hard to argue. And yourself, Doug, how are you doing? Yeah, I think I'm the same as most. Um, depressed, angry, confused, scared, don't know what to do. Seen it all before. Meh. I think that's the problem, isn't it? That we have kind of we've seen this story before um, been here kind of got out of it courtesy of Gerard and his run of games and now it's almost like we're straight back there um, Billy I'll come to you first then so I guess after the game and now you know we're 24 hours plus to reflect on it what's what's your kind of summary of what we saw yesterday People have probably heard this on on various other other shows or podcasts they listen to because it's a everybody's seen what you know we've seen. We had a good ten minutes, ten thirteen minutes. We were pressing quite well. Um, then they get that goal that gets chopped off. But instead of us getting a buzz from that, they got the buzz and we just completely regressed into each individual player regressed into their own shell. Not one of them. Um, after that moment, from my and my point of view and opinion, gave anywhere near the commitment that the Celtic players gave. Um, all over the park, they lost out in their duels. The 50-50s all went Celtic way, not because that you know. I'm not going to sit here and say that um, you know Liam Scales is a is a Celtic legend or um, Alistair Johnson is going to be a Celtic legend, but these players just gave more and wanted it more than any of those players did after that first ten minute period. Yeah, and I think Doug, when we when we were talking about a preview for this, one one of the things we touched on was, um, you know, basically the way that Gerard did have us up for these games. You know, we we may not have had the most technical players at that time, but your effort, your graft, your determination, your will to win was all there. You didn't see any of that yesterday, did you, mate? No, that's it. I mean. You know, there's there's two sides to every game. There's there's the quality of the players that you have, and you know, I think if any any Rangers fan that's going to be honest with themselves, they'll say that you know Celtic have had a better team than us for a while. Um, they have that by virtue of having more money they can spend on 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 their players. Um, and if we'd lost that game just because they'd been better as a team technically, just because of that, most people would have said, and we'd played well. Most folk would have went, okay, we're, we're good or something. They would just better chalk it down to that. But the problem is the second side, where, like you say, even, um, and this and this is where Clement is getting in the neck at the moment now because, you know, he tried to pull out there, oh, but, you know, we had a similar amount of shots and a similar amount of the ball. And it's, and it's like, well, yeah, technically, technically we, 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 we did all those things similarly. Technically, all those things were close. But when you watch that game, after that first you know, eight to ten minutes that Billy just mentioned, at no point did you ever think we were going to, never mind win the game, even draw the game. Um, and there's been times in previous games where you know, we've even seen a little bit of spark. We've come back into it in the second half. We didn't really do that much at all. Um, and that's really concerning because um, if we can't, if we're, if we're going to doing this rebuild and we're going to work towards getting better, the bare minimum you have to do between now and then is give it your all, and we don't seem to be doing that. Yeah, yeah, can't just can't argue with that. To be honest, mate, it, um, it it's rare that I've seen a team that it just feels like. And I, I mean, I get this is wrong, and I know there's a whole host of technical details, but you almost felt at times like they didn't really care. Um, I think we'll come on to it, but you know some of the imagery that you can see from the game, there's players sauntering about. It's that desire, as you say. You don't need to be good to have desire. For me, you know, you can be a very limited player, and we've seen a few over the years that have played for us. Um, I mean, Walter Smith was probably the master of 
pulling out folk that weren't necessarily the best, but you know they were well organised and they gave it their all. And often enough, it saw us take a result. Um, just coming on to this one then, and um, I just want to give thanks to Doug for putting all these slides together because some excellent information in here. Um, I rather suspect your first one's going to be controversial, Doug. Um, so let's just fire it up here and we'll talk through this one. So this is obviously an overall uh, sort of highlight of the game, if you will. Not that there was that many highlights. Um, we can see from the top left the match momentum um, very heavily favouring Celtic for large parts of it up until that third goal. In the opening period that Billy's already mentioned. Um, I want to come to this list in the middle, Doug, because um, I'm pretty sure number three on there is uh, going to generate a bit of commentary in here. So talk us through this. Obviously, this isn't saying that he was amazing. This is strictly looking at key passes. Tell us about them. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that we should say is, you know, no player got really got pass marks um, yesterday. Um, the only two that I think really had any kind of industry to them to any great degree was Tavernier and uh, Diomande. And, and that's kind of comes out in the numbers of the game. Um, but I mean, but neither, even with that, neither played well. Um, and this is part of the, you know, part of the problem. And, um, and, and I think, you know, we've obviously we touched on um, beforehand and, and in group chats. You know, Tavernier is getting a huge amount of flack right now. He was a partial fault for the goal um, in terms of his part. There were faults before his as well. Um, and, you know, there's just a huge negativity around him. And people don't understand why he continues to get into the team and why he's continued to be picked by manager upon manager. Um and the numbers are underneath things are ultimately why Tavernier gets picked because he does he does things that aren't necessarily always the flashiest parts. I mean, he's done that in the past with the goals and free kicks and, and various bits of ups. But he is still a player that drives the team and, and is involved in a lot of what the team do. And this is part of the problem that we have, that as his effectiveness has declined over the last two years in particular, he's still involved but the team is still relying on that involvement and there's not enough other players that are, that are getting themselves into the game and being driving forces. Um, and so if you're relying on a player who's, who is a fading power, then your team as a whole becomes less and less effective. And I think that's something that really bore out in this game because we talked again in the preview that Tavernier has been one of the players that has made impacts in, in the old times over recent years in terms of getting goals and assists, but he did neither um, in, in this game. So, as I say, the, the centre section is um, the is filtered by key passes um, to, to, to see who was, you know, who was making those killer sort of movements with the ball. So you've got the players you expect, Maida, um, Dawson Bernardo was in there, Kuhn, who I, th I think set up the first goal, um, certainly involved. But I mean, you can look at the other other things that are that are in there. I mean, Tavernier had 102 touches in that game, by far more than anyone else in the pitch. He was involved in the game, um, crossing, creating chances, all this type of things, and he was ultimately our highest rated player um, uh, across you know, most of your rating sites. And and again, that's not. I think sometimes when people look at those things, again, rating sites are slightly out in terms of when they create these overall ratings because it still doesn't necessarily mean he had a great game because the ratings are based on figures. And if you're heavily involved in a game and thus creating numbers and building numbers, then you'll get a better rating. And that's why Tavernier, I think Tavernier has been the highest rated player in the league for like three or four years in a row. Um, and it's because he's heavily involved in games, but he's not making the decisive impact. Um, and if he's not making the decisive impacts, then that then just leaves you with the other half of his game, which is, Getting done by Maida at the back post, which is exactly what happened um, in the game. Um, but I mean, there was those faults prior to that as well. We talked about in the preview play the importance of the wingers being involved in defence. Tavernier was left on his own time and time again, one on one with either Maida or sometimes with other players. 
if I'm the manager and I've been looking at all these previous games, I'm going, right, Maeda has a, 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 a more than a guard on Tavernier. I need to do, if I'm going to play him, I need to cover for that. So I need to make sure that either Cherney or one of my defensive midfielders is going to help Tavernier to, to do that. That didn't happen. And so I think but on purpose, in the first half in particular, there were so many times that Celtic were breaking down the left and crossing to the right. Because the I I think anyway they were looking to isolate that side because if I if I was Brendan Rodgers that's probably what I'd have done, and and that was where they got joy, um and we fell down for the same reason on the left because Matondo for that first goal didn't track his runner well enough and so he gets left with a nice easy cross ball, Proppers ended up on his arse and the ball slips past and so we we lose a goal there, but I think the key concern for me now. Um, as in these big games, you know, Tavernier is involved, but there's not enough from him to make the difference anymore. And if there's not enough from him, then the question has to be, well, where's it coming from? And the only thing I can think of right now is that hopefully that's going to be Bajrani, but that, that remains to be seen. It's the hope, isn't it, mate? Um, Alexander. Don't worry, we are absolutely going to get on to Jack Butland as we go through this one, so keep, stay tuned, mate. Um, Billy, I think the one thing that jumps out at me from pretty much all of these lists is um, there's a relative lack of Rangers players in there. Um, Tav appears in a couple, you've got Dessers, Dio, but overwhelmingly these are you know, the lists have been topped and predominantly full of Celtic players. How how do you get past that? I mean, how some of these duels getting yourself in a position to take a shot, I mean, again, that's that's will. It's not necessarily skill. We're not saying it's got to be a fantastic shot. It, even then, we're just not doing it. How do you get past that, mate? I, I don't know how to get past it, but if you just consider the first the first goal all the points of failure that, that, that happens. It's not just one player does something wrong. It's the midfield don't stop the pass going out to the right. Matondo doesn't track uh, his runner, as uh, Doug was saying, uh, proper slips, I think, uh, and can't clear the, the cross coming in. And then you also have, I, I don't I don't know what kind of, I don't know what he's doing. The button goes down before the shots even, even hit. And, um, for me, he sh- he should be doing a lot, you know, more than a lot better. He should be saving that. Uh, I think in the second half, um, Smichael makes a, a similar kind of save to uh, McCausland, does it? Yeah. So it's like he. So that's just not that's not one. That's four five points of failure. And the problem is that, that resulted in a goal, but we were getting cut open. And I said this in last week's pod, but Ross County did it to us when we had the ball in their box, mm. and within five seconds they're taking a shot an hour. So. There is something fundamentally wrong. I feel like the all three sections of the team, the defence were too deep. The midfield were nowhere near um, helping Dessers. Dessers was left alone most of the time. And uh, another thing I noticed as well yesterday was that they were either overhitting things to each other, so the ball was kind of ping-ponging off players' right. feet and a Celtic player would nip in and get it. I don't know if this just comes from lack of confidence or lack of playing with each other. And that may improve as time goes on, but just um, when you look at these these uh, statistics that Doug's put up for us here, and the lack of Rangers players in the top, you know, five or six, uh, in all these different areas, bar you know one or two, but it's, it's Tavernier that's still heavily involved in all all of our um, play. I think one of the co- we have a, obviously a group chat, uh, and one of the guys in there uh, watched the game back today, and, and I think he said was it that. All but one of our chances come from Tavernier, you know, starting it or, or being involved in it heavily. So when you've got a player who's not the same as he used to be, um, what do you what do you do? Do you, everything's still coming through him to a degree? If you take him out, does that mean nothing comes through anyone, or do you actually get the other player stepping up? And my other rant I'm going to go on about was there's not one leader on that park in our team yesterday. To, you know, we've got an ex-captain and Robin Proper, and I'm not, I'm not by no means writing him off. He had a bad day yesterday. It's like he was over overwhelmed by the by the whole occasion. So, I guess I'm not really answering your question, mate, because you don't get by this stuff unless they improve it themselves. Because 
as we're saying, okay, Celtic might have better players on paper, but you know, lots of teams with inferior players still beat you know better teams because they want it more, or they're hungrier, or, or they're, they're braver. There was no bravery yesterday at all, bar eight nine minutes. All right. Um, so speaking of bravery, mate, I am just going to flash up our first goal that we conceded. So this was um, wasn't the one that was ruled outside offside. It was the first actual goal that counted. Have a look at this and the positioning of the players. So you can see here comes in. We let Johnson in the byline. Proper's in no man's land. Tav, miles away from Maeda, but I think more worryingly, he's probably in the right place if he was paying attention. Ball comes back, Maeda takes it, slams it home. Sticking with you, Doug, um, as you said, the, there's probably a bit of catalogue of errors there, and it probably actually does... Uh, sorry, sticking with you, Billy. Um, it probably does go back further than kind of what I've shown there. I don't think we want to watch it all over again for the whole game. Um, firstly, what's proper doing, mate? I mean... To be honest, see, see if he doesn't slip, he probably clears that ball. But you're right, he's not marking anyone. He's not closing no. anyone down. Uh, he's not affecting the play whatsoever. So whether it's just an experienced... Uh, not an experienced playing football, he's a very experienced football player, but uh, an experience with how Celtic play, because we've seen that goal. We've seen it yeah. five minutes before. Um so we we see this goal regularly. He's maybe just not aware of it. Um, but Tav should have been clearly I mean, he's a captain, should have been letting know where, where he should have been. But yet you said that no man's land, he's unlucky that he slips, but he also probably should have a better positioning in the first place. Yeah. And Doug, just um I know it goes against your nature to badmouth Tav, but um far from the only one, definitely culpable for that, I would say. Would you agree? 100%. He's caught at the back post. Um, the the only thing you could you, even if I was grasping at straws would be that the ball is going away from him and he has to turn to it. But if he's more alert, he does that and clears it. Um, you know, he can slide in. He does start to slide in. But the I mean, you, you pointed out at the beginning of the clip, he's in a decent enough position. Made uh, is far is a reasonable distance behind him. But at this stage, he should know. Um, by God, should he know that Maida will cover that like that because yeah. it's the biggest attribute that he has is his speed and his quickness. And so unless he just wasn't aware he was there at all, then he should have known that he needed to get to the ball as soon as possible because Maida would cover that ground very quickly. And let's just say that's exactly what happens. And But see, there's, there's faults beforehand, but ultimately he was there to defend that that space and that player and didn't do it. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, I fully take what you say and he might not have been aware from what we see in the video there. For me, he should be looking around to kind of see where my head is, as you say. Absolutely, if he's not as aware, Billy that's said. a mistake as well. Yeah. And, I mean, Billy said it. It's not, not the first time we've seen that, is it? Um, okay, so... So... This was the second goal, and do you know what? I think we've kind of covered the outfield failings already on the other two goals, and there was failings. If I remember rightly, I think Kyogo was just about out near the touchline when he first picked up that ball, and, I mean, you can see there he's very, very central, run of the park to shoot. Doug, that, that positioning, mate, that is quite frankly awful, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, he, he, he touches on, on it in his, his post match. I think he sort of says something about um, where the ball was and, and, and shifting himself into position. But, I mean, even if that's the case, he needs to be doing it faster because mm. Kyogo's approaching his uh, a six yard box and um, or his, his, his box, and he's got a clear, clear view of the goal there. Proper is, uh, you know, there, but with that amount of space. He does exactly what he needs to do, which is just hit it early before proper can do anything about it um, in terms of getting in the way. If he takes another couple of steps forward, you know, proper comes in and, and narrows that angle between him and the keeper. But, you know, Kyogo's a good player. So looks up, sees practically 
well, just over 60% of net available and he's not going to miss from there. Yeah, and um, just on that, so this is Butland's stats from the game and, you know, fully appreciate, I don't don't want to go full Philippe Clement here and just say stats that are all that matters, but no, nah, I'm joking. I, it, even with the kind of whole stats don't tell the whole story of the game, which, you know, I do tend to agree with, I think, it does show here six three isn't a great rating, is it, Billy? And there's nothing else really in here that kind of suggests he had a cracking game either. Was that a me, Dave? Sorry. It was, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry mate. Sorry. I'm, I'm looking. I'm kind of looking at the the figures. To, um, I, I'm going to just go back to his to his positioning. It's it's not even like Kyogo smashes that he places it side foots it into the bottom corner, and it's not even right in the bottom corner. It's posi- hearing him defend his positioning was just added fuel to the fire of my anger at the situation yesterday because Kyogo has time to get from the, the, the byline or out by the touchline to get to where he is now, but he can't get back, what, five yards from where he, his starting position was. I just think he doesn't know where he is and um, he's probably panicking. And yeah, that, that's too big a, a net for him to miss. But even it's it's what was astounding was really just wasn't a screaming shot. It seemed to, I know it's not, it didn't trundle in, but it seemed to in comparison to, you know, other shots in the game. Um, but yeah, I mean, his, his stats there, that probably, probably looks okay. I mean, two saves. Yeah. I think, what well, did they have four shots on target? Um, I guess the, the saves might not yeah. necessarily do the ones on target, but yeah. um, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't really know what to, to, to say about because this. We lose three goals. He's not had a good game, despite him saying he thought he did. And I feel that he is at least two and a half goals responsible for for those three goals. Not not fully responsible, you know what I mean. But he could have affected, you know, at least two of them. So it's been a disappointing. My, my, I'm not saying it's time to drop him or anything like that because I think he is still an improvement on on Liam Kelly. So that I'm not not saying that. But he really needs to have a look at himself and not come out and say he thinks he had a good game, uh, unless he's been misquoted and it's just. But um, because I've only read that he said that um, he didn't yeah. have a good game. I I'm not sure if he has said it, but I saw saw the same kind of commentary. It it feels a slightly bizarre thing to say. I I'm not convinced he hasn't been misquoted. I'm sure someone will correct us in the comments if he has, but. You know, for any keeper with his experience to come out after a three nil loss and say that he's had a good game just just seems a bit weird to be honest. Um Doug, looking at the other players then, because we can sit and talk about Butland, we, we can talk about you know, let's face it, we can probably talk about most of the team. Um the, these are three that we kinda picked out and you know, I wanted to steer away from the usual let's pick on tap for uh, Matondo because they, they tend to get it more than most. Um, just take us through these Desser's stats and what you made overall of his input in that game, Doug. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the big things, the, the two big moments he had, he had two big chances um, that, well, one, one big chance and one good chance. I would say uh, one in each half, and um, the first one sp- specifically, he should, in my opinion, should be scoring. Second one's a little bit harder, but um, the the thing that disappointed me most was that both of them were just really weak shots. And I think there was a third one in there as well, where he just doesn't. We were talking about um, in another pod, Zaf, um, or the it would have been the post match for Ross County. That he was just smashing them and, and uh, seemingly getting some some uh, joy out of that in terms of just really hitting the ball through and getting it into the goal. And he just if he'd done that, he'd have probably scored at least once yeah, um, on Sunday. But for some reason, he just sort of reverted back to to this um, to this weak shot that uh, he has a, a tendency to have on occasion. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, that was the, the most disappointing thing. Because I, I think if he hits it properly in his first shot, he probably scores. Um, and that that would have, have changed the, the nature of the game completely. 
Yeah, and Billy, Fast Love Journey's probably been one of the bright lights so far this campaign, um, despite the amount of negativity that's been going about. Um, rating there suggests that, I think it's fair to say, the eye test agrees with it as well. He had a howler yesterday. Were, were you surprised by that? Did you maybe think that he would struggle to cope with the atmosphere? No, from? because he's played there before and he's scored there before. Um, so no, I didn't think he, that was that was mystifying actually that that performance because he almost like he was telling the players what he was going to do. He was going to try and cut in every single time and try to cut in on his left, and it was it was his only trick. Um, at least we've seen him in recent times. He, he's he's started well the season well for us. So again, not writing him off, but he didn't have a good day yesterday. Whether he just was, I don't know, just. Over overawed, I guess, but you say he's played there before on a European night. They'll be almost as loud, um, and it's not like there's going to be lots of away fans. Um, that he was, you know, they, it was a maybe more uh, the crowd really got on on top of him. But he he went missing, was very slow in tracking back as well, wasn't helping with the defence, and um, yeah, just not not on it at all. Yesterday, he's, he's going to have to. Hopefully he learns from this and um, hopefully maybe one of the most senior players has a word with him about what's expected of him. If he's going to be one of our, you know, uh, marquee signings from this, this summer window, he needs to do it in the big games, not just against the likes of Ross County. Doug, just before we move on, I, I just want to stick on a point that Billy made there. Um, so, you know, Billy's rightly said that Potentially one of the senior, more tenured pros at the club needs to have a word, line out the kind of expectations on him. Is anyone actually in a position to do that right now? Um, well, I mean, that's obviously, that should be coming from your manager, should be coming from your, your leadership team. Um, something, I can't remember who it was to point out, but someone pointed out a couple of weeks ago Um we still, as far as I'm aware, don't have an official vice captain. Um, I presume it's Butland because um, he's taken the armband, I believe, when uh, Tavernier didn't play in the, the preseason games. So my assumption would lead to that. But I mean, at the end of the day, it, it can come from anyone. I think um, there's nobody uh, one upside, I suppose, to nobody. Um, to them all kind of feeling together is that they can try and create a, a, an atmosphere of right let's all help one another let's boost this up let's let's um let's you know push forward together as a as a unit um but the captain is the person that you know that's part of their job description so this is something that Tavani should be doing in the background um and um and as I say, Clement as the manager, I do think that um, people talk a lot about that in terms of the captaincy, but I do think it starts from the manager and works from that point on. That was one of the points I had made in the preview about the difference from Gerard. I feel like, um, you know, that that passionate mentality um, that we had under Gerard, I think just sort of slowly over time, drifted away as we had managers that were less inclined to be in that way. Um, and I think, as I say, these things start from the manager. The manager sets the standard and then your captain is the one that makes sure that that is, uh, is being continued through the team um, and obviously carries that onto the pitch. So whether it's him or not, however, we've got new players in there. We've got people who are going to be there longer than Tavernier. Um, I think most most will uh, agree this is almost certainly going to be his last season at this stage. So there's people there that could you view this as, as an opportunity, like maybe a Baron um, or a, or a Diomandi or someone who could be saying, you know, I want to be the next driver of this team. I want to be the person that brings this team success. So there's an opportunity there as well for someone to fill that void if they want to. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, I guess the the problem for me is it's the old, you've got to lead by example as well, haven't you? And I think that comes to what you're saying about the manager showing the passion. You need that same passion from a player before they're really in a position to go and tell someone else to show that passion and desire. 
Um, just coming on to Diamande then, Billy. Um, stats here actually look slightly better. Um, if I'm being honest, that doesn't match the eye test either. Uh, what were your thoughts? He just didn't. I mean, I, I've wanted to see him in that number 10 position, whether um, he can do that in other games. It wasn't the right game yesterday for him, I guess. Uh, but you only let I me. Mean, the team that went out, I think, was pretty much everybody's you know, idea of the strongest team. We didn't want to see Lawrence in that number 10 uh, and wanted Diamanda to, to have a go at it. I just don't think it, it worked out. He, again, was he overawed? He just seemed to disappear. Um, like like a lot of young players, when when they come to us, the the skillful and the, they've you know been good at other teams, uh, or, or other youth, uh, you know the youth academies, they've been standout players. But when it comes to to the you know the, taking the game by the scruff of the neck, they've maybe not got it at that. He maybe doesn't have it at his age at the moment. I still think he's a good player. Um, he can go missing at, at points in games. Um, just feel like again. After that first 10 minutes, I don't remember him really doing anything particularly influential. And, you know, we can we can listen to Clement talk about the stats the way you've kind of mentioned with Diamanda the there. The, none of the team passed the eye test yesterday. doesn't matter if they had a similar uh, possession rate or we had similar shots on target or we had similar um, whatever. Um, we were out, out fought in every position in the park. Um, so Diamanda, just a bad game. He's had, um, I wouldn't say he's had full bad games for us, but he has kind of dropped out of games at, at points. And does that, does yesterday show that he's not a number 10? Probably, actually. Um, we we really need, um, I just, the, the new signings <laughs> name is, uh, went out of my head, sorry, but we maybe need him to step up instead of uh, playing Diamandi in there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Doug, just on that. Did you see Diamande as a potential 10? And has yesterday significantly changed your mind if you did? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure yet. Um, like Billy said, he's, he's never really, I think, grasped um, any games, apart from maybe a couple of early games where he, he did look bright. But the thing I've been wanting to see is I'm really grasping a game and, and taking control of it, whichever way he's done it. He's kind of... He can be kind of quietly industrious, which I thought he was in this game. He didn't look like he was really. He he, he kind of drifted in and out, but he was like you can kind of see from like getting involved in terms of you know being fouled and and his tackles and um, the number of duels he was involved in. So he was kind of industrious within the game. But the thing that we need, I think, from players like him is. And what I what I presumed that we had bought him for was a little bit more of that creative spark and and doing a little bit more to change the game. It's fine to be involved in the nitty gritty, but everyone, will, someone's going to be end up being involved in that by default. Um, when you're a midfielder, you're going to get involved in some of that stuff. The stuff that we really need though is the the difference making passes, um, the balls that we see splitting our our defence. Um, and games, we need players like him to be doing that kind of thing, um, and uh, and that's what I think we've been missing and what we're not getting enough of. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I'm seeing a lot of comments talking about how he'd be better in a flat three. Um, I tend to agree personally. I think potentially that would suit him more playing maybe at the the middle of a flat three, but. I guess for me, the worry is uh, I see zero intention that Clement is going to go that direction, Billy. Do you do you think that he will persevere with him in a two, or will we adapt? Where do you see it? He hasn't, hasn't shown any sign of adapting for this point, mate. I don't I don't think. I mean, once or twice, maybe changing, tweaking the formation, but that's usually at the back. So, no, I, I, I don't know why... I mean, ninety percent of the fan base, when we read comments at various points online, are asking why we're playing this number ten when we don't have a good enough number ten to play it. Hopefully, that will change once we come back from uh, the, the international break and we, we see the new one in, in place. So, I don't think he's going to change. He's bought a player to play that position. See, but th- this is where managers lose their jobs is when they refuse to see what's right in front of them. 
whether it be with with Tavernier, whether it be with um, you know playing Scott Wright in the past, or whether it be uh, in this in this position with playing a number ten when we probably have players that suit a different formation. You know what? And, and he could prove us all wrong, and it's going to work out. It just needs time. He keeps saying, you know, in two three months we're going to be a better team. We're going to be a different team. Well, can't wait for those two three months to pass so I can see a team that actually you know knows what they're doing, is set out to do a job, do it properly, be a hundred and ten percent committed to doing what they're doing, to going into tackles. You know, whenever, whenever, whenever you know, we've spoken to Kevin Thompson on, on the pod before, and he talked about how you'd want to go and you know leave something on a player, not not deliberately dirty, but just let them know you're there. Yeah, I don't think that happened until um, Agaman did it in the, towards the end of the second half uh, on Carter Vickers. So it's just that, you know, you're pointing for whether he's going to change position. No, I know, a long way, long way around, mate. No, I don't, I don't think he is because we've seen, you know, his tweaks here and there, but it's never to do with the number 10. And Doug, just again on Diamande, is there a certain amount of parallels with the Raskin situation here? Came in initially well thought of, did well. Struggles to really nail down a position that he's at home in. To be honest, I think you can kind of parallel the story across multiple players um, on the team and across multiple seasons. It's been the problem, and and that we're just not it, it's we're just not seemingly recruiting good enough players. Um, we have people that come in who can do things here and there who are good for a few games, who have a run now and again. Um, but outside of, I suppose, maybe Lundstrom, who had a, who had a, a solid six to eight months of, um, of quality play, I can't think of too many other players that I can sit down and say, right, we bought him, he came in and he was good and he was good for a significant period of time. Um I, I personally, I would potentially say Sakala. I, um, see, he, I feel like, came more in and out due to choices rather than his uh, ability per se. But even then, I mean, he was still inconsistent um, in, in big games too. So it's really been our problem. Is that Part of the transfer model is getting young and upcoming players, but they still need to be good enough for what we need them to do. Um, and that still seems to be a bit of a, an issue is that whether that's unlocking, whether it's just not getting the right players or do we not have good enough coaching staff um, to bring these players on well enough. Um, one or two players can make a difference. So like you say, you know, maybe if Agamani comes in and he's a, a marauding type that will get himself bullied about, um, that you know that might help if, if Bajrami can be a player who can unlock... Um, Unlock defenses if the um, if the the other lad uh, the Dutch lad can come in and solidify the defence a bit. You know, that's a player in, in every area of the pitch. So maybe that can make a difference. You know, one or two players can affect the team and get get the crowd up and uh, and that can then create your like that feedback loop between crowd and fans that build their uh, crowd and team. Sorry, that builds confidence and pushes you forward. Um, and so I kind of feel like that's what I'm hanging my hope on at the moment is that these guys are going to come in and make a bit of a difference that some of these players will pick up. Um, we've not touched on him so far, but I mean, Jeff, he was fairly quiet in this game, but he's been good up until now. Um, I, I think it was someone in our chat that did sort of make the point that we did have a few old firm debutants um, and often um, old firm debuts are difficult. So, Maybe some of them come better um, in the next game. Um, I'd like to think maybe Jeffy could be one because he is someone that I think could make a difference with his attacking player. Um, but he was kind of blunted early on with his yellow card. But um, yeah, I mean, go back to my original point. I think you can make this that point for multiple players, um, and that's uh, you know too many. We need to have players that can just come in and affect games and affect them game after game after game after game yeah yeah fully agree um all right just just a yes or no and a quick sentence on why you think that 
and feel free to give them abuse in the group chat afterwards. But we've got a question from one of our other podcasters, Gary, that's come up. But once has had a material impact on us losing last two Celtic games. His career littered with drops in form. Should Kelly start the next game? Doug, you go first, mate. Um, no, and because I think goalkeepers more than any position need to play themselves back into form. Um, I, th- I think it's dangerous to to move too quickly to such a goalkeeper. Okay. Billy? I'm going to have to do a devil's advocate because I probably do agree with Doug, but I'm going to say yes, just because he needs to know that he's not undroppable. We give him a lot of praise when he first came in. You know, he was a really good goalkeeper for the first bit, but his form has dipped, not just in these two uh, old form games that you say we he materially caused an impact on us losing. So I would say, yeah, why not? Drop him. See if, see if it improves him. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, I'm going to split the middle, sit on the fence, pretty much any adjective you can think of. I think um, I think he does start the Dundee United game for me. Um, again, as you guys have said, there's almost an element he needs to play himself back into form. But I think there's a cup game coming up just after that. And I think that would absolutely be the natural choice to give Kelly a game, especially if Butland has another one that isn't so great against United. Um, I did notice the last Cup game, obviously, Butland started, which seemed a bit of a strange one for me. I'd have thought that that would be the ideal time to give Kelly some competitive minutes. Um, But yeah, that's probably the approach I would take. So, just to sort of round this one off, put yourself in the manager's shoes for a minute, guys. Um, You've got two weeks, and well aware, you know, there is plenty of folk away. For the ones that are there, what do you work on in those two weeks? Um, Billy, we'll come to you first. Well, if if the manager does have a style, they need to just drill that style. Um, I guess getting them used to playing with them, you know, play as much, you know, bounce games or whatever they can to start getting used to each other. There is, there has been a big turnaround in, in the squad and I would say that I guess maybe Tav is the only one still there that's part of that old old group. You know, Butland could be part of the new um, kind of leadership group of that dressing room. You'd think someone like Proper. Uh, there was a comment further up uh, about how there's a few captains in that team um, from previous clubs. So getting these guys together to form a new leadership group and, you know... You've got one side of it where Clement needs to. If so, if I'm Clement for a minute, like I need to drill into them that that what they gave out on Sunday is not good enough to be a Rangers player. The commitment, the desire, the bravery, none of that's there. But that's off the field stuff. On the field, they need to be working on what this system is. And um, I'm not, I'm not one of the statos, so I don't know um, what I'd call the system. But if he's playing with this number ten, just get them used to to drilling what um, is to happen. And yourself, Doug, what, what would you be working on if you were the manager for the next couple of weeks? Uh, well, he said integrate the new players. So, uh, Bajrami and the, um, the Dutch lad get them uh, the team. I, I believe Cortez is, is ready. Um, so, you know, getting him back in. And then, like Billy said, he just needs to work on building them as a team. Um to be honest, they could maybe just use a night going out and get totally and utterly wasted and <laughs> having a good time. Build a bit of camaraderie, then spend two days hungover, have a curry, and then get back into the training. Because um, that, that's maybe a bit old school, but I, I do feel like it could uh, maybe maybe a, uh, a day uh, where they do something together and just forget about the football for a minute and focus on bonding as a team. Let me see, we've brought in a lot of new players. What was it? something like 11 out and 11 in so get them bonding create a positive atmosphere and then work hard on the training pitch and underline that what you've just done is about 20% of what you should be doing Um, so we need the other 80 um, and we need to I like that idea Carrie we'll do do it in the morning we'll have an event in the morning Um, so yeah get them in a 
try and get them in a good place and then just work, work, work and um, build on what they need to build on and uh, and yeah, just they really need to get it through them that right, that is not what is expected. This this is what is expected and then drill that. Can I just come back in, Dave? Yeah, yeah. Just the just the comments you brought up um regarding um Clement and the tactics going into another old firm game. You know, and the same goals, same type of goals being scored against us, and not drilling for that or practicing that and training. Um, it reminds me of the, the Blackadder quote of, "We've done the same thing the last seventeen times. It's the last thing that anyone will expect this next time." But it's not. It's the same. It's the same. He's not went in and changed anything or adapted to the way Celtic play. Now, maybe you think we shouldn't have to adapt. We're Rangers, but that, the, the fact is that they have more money than us. They have probably better players than us at this point in time. So to get an upper hand, you have to kind of think out the box a wee bit, and that's not going in with the same same tactics. You have different players, but same tactics against against them, especially at, at their place. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely bang on there, Billy. Um, you know, <laughs> it's the old definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. And I think that quote's been dredged up a few times, hasn't You've it? You've said it in uh, the last two pods. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't me that said it last time. It was Scott. Nah, I've just well, stolen it. I've listened to so many <laughs> podcasts today, mate. Aye. So many post matches. <laughs> Point, point stands for, doesn't it? it yep. Like you say, you cannot keep doing these same things. And do you know what? It's crushing as a Rangers fan to say this, but right at this minute, they are a better side than us. So just expecting to turn up and impose our game on them isn't going to work. And I, I keep harking back to it, but if you think about the Gerrard days, we, we didn't rock up a superior team for a lot of those games. We'd rocked up with the right attitude and for me that's what's missing i think that's you've both kind of touched on it we need to get through to these guys that what they delivered isn't acceptable and then start shaping them it's almost the old kind of knock them down to build them back up thing um i think for me that's probably where we're at at the minute so on that happy note um i think that's us kind of covered everything for tonight Billy, thanks very much for coming on. Anything you want to say before you head off? Uh, just in case you miss it, mate, because there was a, a message uh, in the chat to just to thank Rangers TV for the, the footage that we ah. were able to use. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to say that. Just wanted to touch, if you don't mind, on the pods coming up this week, because uh, Scotty would normally uh, touch on that. Uh, again, we'll be doing the Rangers news at lunchtime on, on Friday, but um, I'm delaying time so I can find your post that you put in the chat earlier on for the <laughs> the, the schedule this week. So on um believe you <clears throat> we'll be doing an interview tomorrow on Badge Rami, I guess. Yep. Um Dave. So uh hopefully I'll be around for that. I don't know if there's any other guys going to be on for that too. Uh on Wednesday night, and that will be at half past eight on Wednesday night, uh, how to change the season. So Gary's going to be leading that one. Uh, a QA show this week will be hosted by Kev. So look forward to that one. That is at nine o'clock on Thursday. As I said, the Rangers news at 12 o'clock. And then 24, 25 Rangers squad review. That's you, Doug, going to be over the, the squad. So all look forward to that. And that's at half past six. But thank you for having me on, Dave. Sorry. No, no, not at all. Um, Doug, thanks for coming on. And if, anything you want to say to the folks? Yeah, just thanks for everyone for coming in, giving your points of view, as always. Um, it's a, a difficult period of time. Um, and not to... Not to mirror Clement, I suppose, because I I do think you you went about it the wrong way. But there is there is a slight bit of truth to what he said in terms of, you know, we played really well last week and that was good, um, and we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater on the at the first hurdle, if you like. Um, but having said that, we really start. We need to coming back from this break. We need to start seeing the team really getting into some rhythm really getting into a bit of swing. Um, more six nails would be good um, against uh, some of the better teams as well. Build a bit of confidence, give the fans something to, to hang their hopes on because if he doesn't um, and if the team doesn't, um, we've already seen things getting a little bit ugly uh, over the last 24 hours. Um, some of the videos and things have been going about. Um, that will only get worse and, um, and we don't want to see that. So, 
it's really down to them now. They have the gauntlet is uh, is there. Um, so I'll just hope that they pick it up. Yeah, cheers, Doug. And I think just echoing what you're saying now, it's a case of getting through the new year, isn't it? Um, you know, incremental improvements each game, putting that behind us. Okay, well, thanks very much for listening, folks. Not the happiest of subjects. Hope you enjoyed the analysis, folks. And just remember, every night's a Rangers Journal night.